Hey there, sinners. It's Adam Knox, and welcome to another episode of The Cult of You and another interview with the devil. My devil today is noted clinical psychologist and former director of the Behavioral Medicines Program at the University of Massachusetts. That's Dr. Edward Bruce Bynum. Now, you may have seen me talk about him before in my book reviews where I covered one of my classic favorites and highly recommended books, Dark Light Consciousness, um, Melanin, Serpent Power, and the Luminous Matrix of Reality, as well as his most recent, Our African Unconscious. Being in South Africa, you can obviously appreciate my fascination with it. But the reason this was such an incredibly interesting read is because one of the subjects that is at the core of modern day occultism is the subject of the unconscious, particularly the personal and the collective unconscious. We speak about its utilization all the time, whether we're hypnotizing our own unconscious or we're trying to influence the for the field of the archetypal mind inside of the unconscious and beyond that into the superconscious and the, so we say, the luminal realms of creation. That's one of the big reasons why I needed to get Bruce on the show. And he happily accepted the offer and shares with us his years of expertise and really helps us understand the development of the unconscious, tracing back the various templates from which most modern day religions and school of thought have inherited their original patterns. Today's look at the subject matter is indispensable to the serious practitioner. It helps us to understand the roots. And if you haven't picked up the book yet, please do get a copy. Because the way he tracks that down helps us to understand the development of the unconscious, which Sigmund Freud himself referred to as the racial consciousness, or the this kind of racial unconscious, if you will, this pure tier. He explores the biology, the psychology, and many other aspects. And today, we dive into that subject quite intensely. We look at the evolution of these concepts. We looked at the diaspora out of the, you know, specific Africa. We look at Black Moses and, you know, the original ideas of Sigmund Freud around that and the influence of the Black Hebrews, the works of the Ifa, the explorations of these stages of consciousness and how they're manifesting and the impact that that faces for us as the world. We look at how we explore the collective unconscious as a group. We look at the need for tension as well as for resolution and the templates that we are establishing going forward as we become a space faring race you know inside of the current times that we live in i am confident you are going to enjoy the work of this absolutely brilliant humble and deeply educated and experienced man um, you can find links directly to all his work and books in the description below you can pop on to his website the obelisk foundation links to that is as well down below where you can learn more about it and you can also purchase the books directly. Definitely something that's indispensable. My first discoveries of it just really helped ground. And you'll see my my raising of the subject of neuromelanin and the effects on the brain and how breath and sound of pa impacts these and the impact that that has for us as ritualists to consider. So I really think you'll enjoy the science and how well he grounds these ideas. But, you know, without any further ado, sit back, relax, and remember to live delicious. Dr. Bynum, 
Welcome to the Cult of You. It is an absolute gift and a pleasure to be able to have a conversation with you. Well, I'm really excited and turned on about uh, being able to talk to so many folks of like mind, like spirit. And I've been looking forward to this for a while. Doc, I got to tell you, this has been an, an absolute honor. I've been a I've been a big supporter and a fan of your work since I I read Dark Light Consciousness, you know, several years ago, and it had a big influence on my thinking. And once I got my hands on our African unconscious, the deep the depth of the level that you went into was profound. And I actually feel like I want to open right there if you're up for it. Yeah, and they call me Bruce, by the way. Bruce, thank you very much. It's it's a, it's a pleasure. The question that I want to pose, or the thing that I want to start with, and I'm sure you've been asked this one a lot of times, but I have a lot of people. We have a lot of people listening to us today that have backgrounds in various forms of mysticism, spirituality, alternative thinking, and the yes. subject of the unconscious is a common one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it, it's also a misunderstood one at a very vast level. Mm-hmm. Um, do you take the hypnotic point of view? Is it biological? Is it purely personal? Is it ancestral? Um, there's the personal and the collective unconscious. When you're presenting the frame here and you discuss the unconscious, what exactly do you mean? And how do you describe that progression? When I'm talking about trying to describe the unconscious, I actually go back to its classical origins, the classical roots. And its classical roots, our, our conception of the unconscious actually arises not from Freud and Jung of the 19th century, but actually all the way back to several thousand years before Christ. In ancient Egypt, ancient Kemetic Egypt, they had a a conception of the unconscious. You know, they were very advanced in astronomy, archaeology, mathematics, uh, geometry, and also biology. I mean, they did a certain kind of uh, surgery. They knew about uh, the functioning of the uh, brain and many other classical pieces of information uh, about medicine that really weren't surpassed until the mid-18th century in Europe. Well, Mm. they also had a very sophisticated understanding of what they call the uh, Amenta and the primeval waters of Nun. This is the unconscious. And that unconscious included not only our personal unconscious, which is, of course, the, the province primarily of, of uh, Freud and Adler, but also the collective unconscious, the area that Jung talked about and many others did. And Freud did also he refer to it as the racial memory. Mm. But the ancient Kemetic Egyptians also talked about the vast, great netherworld, the unconscious of the literal world out of which manifested the physical world. So on some level, they said the whole universe is conscious and part of it emerges in out of that unconscious into manifestation, and that is the conscious uh, physical world, but also the conscious psychic world. So mine really goes back to that time. And, uh, its closest reflection today is probably uh, that of uh, Jung, uh, the collective unconscious and Freud's Freud's racial memory. That it also again includes our individual unconscious, but also our family unconscious. So all these are different gradations and levels of a vast system that includes all of us because consciousness itself is non-local. It's not trapped inside of our heads, inside of our brains. It's not. Mm. It expands greatly beyond that. That is the true origin of human mysticism. So is it is it in one degree accurate to look at it as almost like a template, an evolving template upon which we are then kind of designing ideas yes. upon as well as a shared mind to a degree? That is an excellent description. That's an excellent description. So when when you explore the the kind of should we say the escape or the, the diaspora out of, of comedic Egypt and out of Africa. And you do such an incredible track down in the book to really, I think, biologically connect us to how we are all actually one and we're all really from the same place. Um, yes. But I think what's, what's rich is that development of this, of this collective unconscious through those stages, through those degrees and everything can, can you talk a little bit about how that kind of got started? How did that research 
really evolve from your work in, in family therapy and your work as a psychologist to really dive into those areas that, that it started connecting for you clearly, especially in spite of the contradicting claims from everyone trying to whitewash everything from making, you know, Jesus a white character, regardless of the area that he lives in. You know, that was quite a, a brave challenge to take on. What led you to that and how did that come about? It was actually very practical. I, I, I'm, uh, you know, uh, traditionally cl uh, trained as a clinical psychologist. You know, I saw patients. Uh, my area of specialization was in family therapy and also in psychosomatic medicine. So I saw people with, with f physical medical problems in addition to psychological issues and family issues. And as I explored it deeper and deeper, I had to move beyond the uh, understanding of the unconscious I had through the use of hypnosis and psychosomatic medicine to recognize that it had deeper and more expansive uh, roots and manifestations. And then I began to read, again, some of the overlooked work of some of the classical writers, including Sigmund Freud. And mm. Freud, as you know, uh, authored a book called Moses and Monotheism, in which he described uh, uh, Moses is not a, a, a Hebrew, but a black Egyptian priest. And then I remember I reread the parts of uh, Jung, where Jung described himself as realizing at one time through a trip through Uganda that he was an African. He had a flash of insight. And those two intrepid heroes of mine allowed me to go further and further and further. And then I began reading some of the great in the ancient writers, and that took me back to ancient Kemetic Egypt. And that is what allowed me to sort of like initially tiptoe, but then begin to take big leaps into mm -hmm. that area. And then I began to notice connections between uh, the West African uh, uh, civilizations and their un understanding of the unconscious, because they had an understanding of the unconscious also. Theirs was a more spiritual, uh, existential one in the sense that they talked about uh, fate and the choices we make in life as being affected by the unconscious. And then there were others who talked about the unconscious is not only sort of pushing us, but also there's part of our consciousness that pulls at us, pulls at us toward higher and higher levels of manifestation and expression. Because not all of our creative life, and I can say this definitely as a, as a psychologist and also as an artist, not all of our creative life can be attributed to the un conscious, that consciousness below us, but there is a level of consciousness above and beyond us that pulls us to a higher and higher expressions. And you mentioned this when you talked about uh, delving into dark light consciousness. And that's where I explore there, the super conscious. And that super conscious has been explored primarily by our, uh, our uh, kindred uh, spirits and souls and, and uh, India in particular. So mm. it has a worldwide tradition, but it's been best articulated in ancient and modern uh, India. And so the unconscious, again, has a very wide area and it connects everything because we are essentially all connected. We really are. Sometimes we, find, we can find comfort in that and some of us are frightened of that because mm. we're frightened by certain areas of the unconscious, including our own unconscious areas that are forbidden to us. But nevertheless... <laughs> We are all intricately connected with each other. The minority representation of each of us is enfolded in each other. Oh, oh yeah, that is that is that is very beautifully said. Um, in fact, one of the things, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, finding your your book, especially this this latest one. It was the first time I found almost like a biological direct link to this probability of this idea of we're all one. We've all heard it through every single culture and mystical and um, yes. spiritual system in the world, but very few have traced it as well together. And as well, the esoteric sciences or gave a hint towards that. And that's actually something that I want to little touch on a bit. You okay. mentioned the... Um, almost scientific and medical research that was available to the Egyptians. It wasn't really just a primitive and superstitious people. No. There was science and mathematics and all this you go into quite detail with. And in your book, you talk about the, I believe it is the Edwin Smith papyrus. Yes. And where medicine and psychology almost worked hand in hand together. And, and 
it's 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 interesting how this got later taken out. Can you touch on that? How how did this get taken out? How did this? How do you? What do you believe was what caused the filtering down or the watering down of these ideas as it started spreading out? Well, as you as you point out, in ancient times there was no uh, uh, radical uh, separation between what we today would describe as science and what we would describe as as religion. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were a great uh, scientist back in those days, be it an archaeologist or um, uh, or you were a physician, you also were introduced into the spiritual mysteries. And the ancient Egyptians studied in the per onks or houses of life, and they studied both. And as you as you know, the ancient Egyptians, for uh, for spiritual reasons, studied anatomy. They practiced mummification. That's the word I'm looking for, mummification. And as a result of mummification, you got to know an enormous amount about anatomy and physiology. Mm. Well, so those two were together. And then um, uh, something uh, happened. Uh, after the fall of uh, Rome in the, in the fourth century after Christ, uh, there, Europe went into the, what we describe as the Dark Ages. And certain religious currents made it forbidden to study the body. Mm. It made it mm. forbidden to study the body. And that was temporarily overcome during the, the, the Renaissance when we began to be able to study the body again. But around the 1800s or so, there was another split that occurred. And uh, the world, particularly led by Europe, was pushing toward being a, quote, more scientific culture. But they, 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 in order to become scientific, they thought they had to denigrate the spiritual sciences. And that yeah. is what led to the split. And then that became really ratified in the late uh, 18th and 19th century with the rise of the philosophy of logical positivism. In mm -hmm. other words, in logical positivism, that philosophy, only what we can see and measure was real. And everything else was, by definition, illusion. Fantasy, mm. regression. Mm. Mm. And that didn't start being healed. That dissociation of spirituality from science, medicine, that did mm. not begin to be healed until the uh, middle, to, or rather the earlier part of uh, the last century, the 20th century, began to start coming back together again. But, up in, but they split them off. Yeah. They split them off and they were dissociated from each other. Now we're beginning to bring them back again. Um, that is how that began, as a, as, a, as a quest, an honest quest to become more scientific. But they thought that sci being scientific meant being totally physical. And mm. so we know that today, today based on what we see and also based on the latest developments in uh, quantum uh, physics, uh, string theory, and relativity, that we know that energy is not totally located in any one place, but it's spread out, non-local, mm -hmm. and so is our consciousness. That's the main thing I want to emphasize in, in that in this book, Our African Unconscious. Our consciousness, yours and mine, is not only located inside of our brains, but that energy field is dispersed throughout the universe and throughout each other. And we have mm -hmm. areas of focus, but the energy itself is trans-temporal and trans-spatial as they say in quantum mechanics, trans-temporal and trans-spatial. There's no absolute boundary. And that is can be quite liberating if you take it the right way, I think. Quite liberating. I I, I think it. I think it is very deeply. I also. I also think a lot of what you mentioned now also describes a lot of the psychosis that I see very often happening in some of the spiritual and esoteric traditions. Because I think sometimes the interpretation of certain ideas in spirituality kind of overshoots the esoteric. It overshoots the point where we make certain archetypal patterns, um, supernatural entities from a little bit of a Hollywood condition. If I see young people getting into the esoteric and disconnecting from the psychological relationship it has yes. inside of the spectrum of consciousness yes. that is really a journey within, a journey through dreams, a journey through the inner work, which, you know, I know you're an expert in, but what I want to, what I want to kind of ask around that is if we look at the comedic development really of religion, then as this kind of progression happened, 
these this unconscious template of the initial archetypes from the Osirian myths to all of these others. Now, you describe very nicely how the relationship between the Osiris myth and the Jesus myth, how that progresses. What are some others? What are some patterns that we see today in our day-to-day -day life, in our society as we live as a whole, that stem back from these spaces, if you don't mind exploring that a little bit? Well, uh, one of them that I see uh, from my point of view is uh, the notion of uh, individuality. I mean, we have always been... Everyone has always been an individual. We know that. But for, at different times in our culture and our civilization, the role of the individual has been different. And in some societies, the individual uh, is the penultimate expression of what it means to be a, a human being. Like in our contemporary societies here in the West, particularly here in the, in the States, and I assume in South Africa and many parts of of Europe also, to be an individual hmm. uh, ultimately means to be uh, something that nobody else can be, you know? Uh, many people define who they are ultimately by what they have that is absolutely different and inaccessible to anyone else. So our sense of individuality is based upon our sense of ultimate privacy, epistemological loneliness. Nobody oh. knows the world quite like me. Therefore, that's oh. how I exist. Other traditions, not so much so. In fact, what is ultimate about us is our communal connection with others. Mm. So to me, um, uh, how we understand energy has a lot to do with how we understand individuality or uh, collectiveness. And many people think that if they belong to any kind of collective situation, be it a family or society, whatever, somehow they are in danger of losing their individuality. And I think we as human beings have been caught in that dialectic for a long time, and we have to begin to move beyond that now to recognize that both the individual and uh, that which is beyond us can coexist, and that we as, as beings go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which suggests that maybe we're something beyond our definitions of that. And we're still mm. struggling to articulate what that means. We're still evolving in the cosmos. We are. Yeah, we're still very young, I think, in a, in a universal We are. Kind of we're a young species. But I believe we, we, we see a lot of these patterns from, from the mythologies and the ideas. I mean, one of the interesting concepts that struck me, if I look at how you describe almost this progressive evolution of the unconscious, that it wasn't almost a set thing. It's, it's evolved as the template, as we evolve as a species, collectively adding to these ideas. And yes. uh, there's, a, there's an idea in classic hermeticism called the Iau formula, Isis, Apophis, Osiris. And at a certain biological level, that seems to speak towards change it seems to speak towards the longing of a thing the unification of a thing and the inevitable separation of that thing discovering of its essence and the rebirthing of that the, that same yes. stages of evolution of identity from this what seems to be a pretty immature expression of individuation where it's a separation from the other instead of an interdependent relationship with the other. Uh, how do you suggest we approach that, achieving that interdependence through this evolutionary process within ourselves? I think to achieve it means that we're always going to therefore be uh, moving back and forth from what is known to what is unknown to what is intuitive in us. Mm. And each age, from my point of view, offers a different perspective on that. But that it, by definition, it will never be static. It can't be static any more than our, our consciousness is static. It's always constantly evolving and moving. We are certainly being, but we are also constantly becoming. And I think that that becomes very concrete in our individual experience. I mean... You and I can think about a time when we were five years old mm -hmm. and we understood the world in a certain kind of way. Mm. We may have had a dog, a pet, and we had a relationship with that dog, <laughs> a pet, and we lived in a certain neighborhood and we watched television or whatever, but we had a view of the, of the world and the universe. 
Now, here we are X number of decades later. Well, the intimate core of our consciousness is the same, but we have added immeasurably to its range, its depth, and its capacity for complexity. And yet we still have that, that core sense of I-ness or me-ness. Mm-hmm. And I think in the future, when we are infinitely more complex than we currently are, mm. we will still have that internal locus of I or me or awareness. And to me, going back and forth like that, that is the great mystery. That is the great mystery. I, I, I have not solved that. I'll tell you that loud and clear. And I don't think any of us has. And mm. the only way I think that we realize the fullness of that is when we are in states of consciousness in which words fail us. Mm. Could this be what kind of leads us, I, I think, or puts us at a place where unless we're starting to work together and taking these dimensions of consciousness seriously in the exploration, we may be at a at an existential uh, destructive point or our angst of a whole new definition of where we're heading. I mean, we're looking yes. at the possibilities of the singularity, um, the merger of man and machine, the point where yes. who knows what impacts that may have on consciousness itself right. and our, our right. ability to make meaning. So uh, I think, I think the work that you describe opens up to a very profound spirituality, a profound unification and, I want to touch on this notion of Kundalini um, that you bring forth. And we've spoken about, we, we're all familiar with the subject matter, but you highlight its original origins inside of the Egyptian and how that kind of influences very much the Typhonian cult art influenced out of Egypt into India and our, even our concept of Shakti and, and, and how that kind of yes. roots. Could you yes. kind of open up about that a little bit? Because I think that half sets a nice frame around this. Well, uh, about from a, from the historical written record, from the historical written records, human beings seem to have stumbled upon this at least uh, five thousand years uh, BC. Mm-hmm. And uh, what it is, it's Kundalini. Well, the ancient Dravidian Indians refer to it as Kundalini. Uh, the ancient Kemetic Egyptians refer to it as the Uraeus serpent. But other cultures all around the earth, we all have contact with it. It is a biogenetic energy or force intensely associated, closely associated with the unfoldment of the human nervous system. The human nervous system. As you know, uh, the human nervous system is based upon uh, the phenomenon of, of energy uh, conducted uh, by a phenomenon known as melanin. Mm. Melanin is, is, is a substance that absorbs light absorbs quanta, and it transforms into higher and higher states of manifestation. This is the origin of our nervous system right there in our our mother's womb, in our embryogenesis. We begin to move out of that early stage, and we elongate through that. That is is our nervous system evolving. Well, kundalini is the energy underneath or behind that is literally the, the, the quantum stream of energy that guides our nervous system. It is embedded in all human beings, regardless of who you are. It is our inheritance from who knows where, and it is at the root of our spiritual genius in in innumerable different ways, and also the foundation of our science. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my own uh, study of it and my own practice of it uh, ratifies that uh, for me. Kundalini is the inherent energy of consciousness. It, It is the evolutionary basis of our consciousness, the bioevolutionary base of our consciousness. And I want to emphasize to your audience that it is a physical phenomenon. It is not limited to physical phenomena, but it is embedded in a physical phenomenon. Your nervous system, my nervous system. In the earliest days, the earliest weeks of embryogenesis on forward, and is intimately associated with our consciousness. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Human beings, we don't we don't all of a sudden when we get born become conscious. No, we're we're conscious for a while before we're physically born. Mm. We know from near death studies, thousands and thousands of cases of near death studies, that for some period of time we are still conscious 
after we are clinically dead. So we are conscious prior to our birth for some time, and we are conscious prior to our physical death for some time. And where that ultimately trails off to, we don't really know. That is still part of the great mystery. It is part of the great mystery. And again, consciousness, like energy itself, like matter and energy itself, is transtemporal and transpatial. It is not localized in any one particular place. And that is the origin of our mysticism. That is, um, it's, it's also, also the origin of our, the, the root of our science and the root of everything else, I think. Um, yes. This opens up a bit of a big, big um, subject matter. And it's that one that makes me wish I, I had you for days instead of, you know, for a short period of time, because it can really unpack so deeply. But this idea, the symbolism of the Ankh and these Ankh schools of life, uh, this symbolism of this kind of elliptic circuit and yes. what it suggests, this internal, almost physically rooted relationship between yes. perception or inner perception and neuromelanin <laughs> as a almost like a living current inside of us. Yes. This is this when I first started reading just about these ideas back in dark light like consciousness, it just opened up so much why we become almost luminous in these dark stages of meditative experience yes. with that awakening. Can you, for the sake of the audience, kind of explain neuromelanin versus melanin and, and some yes. of its impacts on consciousness? And if you're willing to hint at it, some of its impacts on dark matter or that. Um, but if we can just focus on the initial piece at first. Well, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great uh, misunderstanding. People identify the, uh, uh, the uh, biopolymer uh, melanin, which, is the, which mm. accounts for the darkening of uh, uh, the skin. Uh, on, with most human beings is on the surface of our bodies and it is on the surface of our all of our internal organs. And it is variable from individual to individual and from uh, 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 ethnic group to ethnic group. It is variable. It is also variable within the people of the same family. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is surface for skin melanin. That is very different in the melanin of our nervous system and our brain. Both mm -hmm. involve the absorption of light, but the melanin in our, in our nervous system and brain, there's no difference there. You know, your brain and my brain are covered with neural melanin, the melanin of the brain. And it's not because of the sun. Our skulls are block sunlight from getting to our brains, and yet our brains are still dark. Why are mm. our brains dark gray, that gray matter of the brain? It is because it is an altogether different phenomenon. Okay. It's an altogether different phenomenon. And it absorbs light from the earliest stages of stages of evolution, transduces it to higher and higher levels of expression. And when it is awakened by various means of meditation, movement, dance, or lots of different ways to uh, consciously stimulate it, uh, it can become amplified by sometimes by a factor of 10. And that hmm. does account for inner illumination, for that inner illumination. When we see the, the figures of people who are uh, 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 saints or divine figures in this or that religion, you notice there's almost always a halo around their head. Well, that is a manifestation, a, a description of that physiological, physiognomic, literally, hmm. feeling that one is illuminated what? that light well, that is what it is i mean when they say light they mean light you know there's light in its uh, objective manifestation okay the physical yeah. world and there's also internal light or subjective light but they are both light hmm. they are both light and melanin and neuromelanin are infinitely intimately involved in that it is neuromelanin however that has got nothing at all to do with race. People need to hear that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of confusion about that. They are not connected. Totally different phenomena. Totally it's, different phenomena. And they're related to each other, obviously, but one is, is, is brain and the other is skin. Mm -hmm. And as human beings migrated out of Africa to different parts of the world, a lot of the surface melanin was loss. It has complicated subsequent with vitamin D and the sunlight and so on and so forth. The point is, 
it shifted as uh, we migrated and adapted to different climates. Mm. But the melanin in our brains was okay. remain the same. Yeah. And so we need to recognize that because that takes us far afield and get into all kinds of useless political arguments about stuff like that. Mm. But I think you're, it touches up on a point you made uh, some time ago in this broadcast, and that is that uh, earlier, I should say when you were speaking, that uh, the unconscious harbors places that are forbidden to us and that frighten us. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. This, this we can unpack a little bit more. I think this is such a rich and important piece of, piece of content. I mean, I've heard as people are in the subject matter on astral and dream actually speak of almost like a guardian of the threshold and that portions of the unconscious are almost protected. Can you just touch on that a little bit more? Well, we, we need the unconscious uh, to have certain areas that are forbidden and it, it, it creates a barrier. You know, uh, in our uh, earlier stages as, hum as human beings, when we were, mm, let's say, immersed in nature, we had to deal with all kinds of things in our physical universe. Mm. And we had to be super alert of that. If we didn't, we didn't survive. And uh, we needed to be very aware of that. Well, as we became more, quote, civilized, unquote, in villages and in cities and in and, and larger societies and so forth, our ability to progress in becoming civilized to a large extent, as Freud said, uh, depended on our ability to deny, suppress, or repress parts of our minds. And so in that sense, the, the forces of repression and suppression that come from the, sub, the unconscious were good. Mm. You, you cannot, and nobody listening to us today, can afford to not repress you have to. Otherwise, mm. you can't, you know, you can't do anything. You'd be overwhelmed with information and data coming in. It's, it's too much coming in. You wouldn't be able to organize it. Yes, patients who are catatonic mm. don't have this many anymore because we, we have medications that mm, soften things quite a bit. But in the 40s, 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s, there would be backwards of hospitals with people who were, quote, catatonic, unquote. That's because they were, they had lost the capacity to repress, and everything was coming in. Oh, wow. Everything was coming in, and so they were terrified. They were terrified, and that, so they sat in a corner and just tried to to just oh, because there was just so much data. Is this is this well, part of part of what? Sorry to interrupt, but is this part of the spiritual? Um traumas that we sometimes see happening in certain traditions where people go through certain types of initiations or processes and they're unlocking a portion of the unconscious yes. that they're not ready for it. They can't process that data. That's right. That's absolutely right. They're not prepared for it, which is why uh, if you are fortunate, you go through a spiritual process in a group situation. That isn't mm. necessarily a physical group, but you are associated with a group so that people can lord of, sort of uh, converse with each other about it and, mm. uh, and, and what to expect on the path and so on and so forth. Uh, because it's, you just can't let all of that through. If you do, you will dissolve. You'll, you'll fall apart. You'll, you'll be, you'll be psychotic. Is that, an, is that an, almost like a, like an egregore of the group that gets created or as a container? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good thing. Mm. It's a good thing. It's not, it's not, you know, repression. And suppression is not always bad. Let me give you a very concrete example of that. Please. Uh, I, um, I don't know about uh, 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 necessarily South Africa and um, other parts of Europe, but I do know here in the United States, um, in the 30, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, people, particularly men, repressed a lot around sexuality. Mm -hmm. And then we began to move into the 60s, and there was a movement much to get rid of all of our sexual repressions. And for the most part, that was a good thing. Mm. That was a good thing. Mm. But you know where it wasn't such a good thing? Is men stopped repressing the natural sexual impulses and attractions they had to their daughters. Mm. They, no, they no longer repressed it. Wow. Mm because they were allowed to think about that in all kinds of other ways. And so it became a natural thing to also admit, allow that into their consciousness. 
Interesting. And then that began the weakening of that. And then all of a sudden we find a significant increase in abuse in family yeah. systems. Because what used to be naturally repressed wasn't automatically repressed anymore. That's that's so selective that's repression is an, an, an important and necessary thing to do. It really oh. is. It, it's it's so well put. Thank you so much for that because I always describe if we look at people getting so excited on, on the left-hand path and these darker aspects of the psyche, it's dangerous in my personal yes. belief, uh, yes. especially when they're not prepared. They're not through an initiatory school or a, a group right. where an egregore is in place like that. And they're going to get in touch with components that the front of the brain, the, the logical brain doesn't have a healthy, mature means of expressing these yes. components That's and it's true. it's dangerous and what was very interesting for me while i was listening to that especially given the time period i know there's been quite a lot of interesting research of the effect of the change of music and the arts inside of the culture and i know there was one specific study uh, about um, jazz music and the advent of jazz music and the shift in, in moralness and openness to certain ideas and concepts as well right after that. And yes. you, you highlight this in the book. You highlight about the effects of, of ritual dance, of music, and of yes. breathing on, on neural melanin and on these yes. systems, specifically like how controlled breathing and ecstatic dance can have an effect on that. Can you explore that a little bit for us? Uh, it's ecstatic dance, uh, music, uh, spiritual methodologies of various kinds, they involve not only the release of energies, yes, and the direction of energies, they also involve the, the practice of various disciplines. I want to underline mm -hmm. the word discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people unfortunately believe that in order to be spiritual, you just toss out your rationality. You toss out any kind of training you have. You just go with it. Mm. No, you're not going to get very far if you do. Exactly. You need methodology. Mm. You need training. You need replication. Mm. And you need consensual validation from a larger community than your own individual ego. Mm. Because your impulses, as is, 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 is noble as they may be, can easily become misguided. Mm. And mm. That, that is an excuse for the modern forms of narcissism we see anywhere. If it feels good, do it. Well, no, not really. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's it's so, almost like these these portions are in their immature when they're first discovered yes. and need and to dangerous. be matured. Yes, yeah, because they can possess the archetypes. Possess in a way they become yes, they overwhelming do. for the untrained psyche. Is that correct? That's right. The, absolutely, absolutely, and that is why you want uh, spiritual mentors. That is why you want to be able to discuss your experience with others who've gone through a similar path, mm. such that you know because every path, uh, every, every every classical path, be it a static dance, be it contemplative, uh, uh, be it any of the others, has a methodology, and from that methodology, you are able to predict what certain things will happen if you continue along this path, and that's a mm. good thing because those are. Those are signposts along the road that your progress is true, that this is not you simply projecting your desires and your wishes, but whether you are on a path that others in the noble path have also uh, walked this path, and therefore you can be assured that this is both a scientific, empirical, and spiritual phenomena, and they are woven together with each other. So that's, that's so fascinating. Um, stepping back, especially because earlier when you mentioned um, Black Moses, right? That that idea and that discovery, that realization that a lot of some of the, the, the Judic traditional ideas around Kabbalah also has its roots inside of the same collective. Yes, it does. It does. It's evolved. And uh, Dr. Joseph Campbell in his work on the, the Year of a Thousand Faces and the work in mythology, that heroic journey we can actually see in the tree of life. Is yes. Can you explore that a little bit more? Just help us kind of get a frame in terms of that evolution of the archetype from there to its more earlier roots and some of your, what would say, big key distinctions in that evolution of it inside of ourselves. We, as a child, as a child, let's, let's make this very concrete. 
as a child, we will have grasp the archetype of the mother. Mm. Okay? We grasp it as a child. We grasp it as an infant. Then, as we go through our development, progression, childhood, that concept of a mother becomes more sophisticated. And at some point, we discover that other people have mothers too. I'm not the only one that has a mother. Hmm. Oh, and then we discover that our pets, dogs, cats, they also have a mother. Hmm. And then as we get more and more sophisticated, we start recognizing that the role of mother itself is very complicated. And then we start thinking about the mother of this. And then we are trying, we're associating that with uh, wisdom, the mother of all wisdoms. And become the idea of mother is my point, becomes much, much more complex. Mm. Now that central core of it remains the same, i.e. that which gives forth life, that which brings forth life. But it becomes infinitely multiplied and much more complex such that by the time we are mature adults, we recognize that the archetype of mother is deep, pervasive, and incredibly sophisticated and interacts with every other archetype that we've come in contact with. Mm. Because we've also developed in early childhood the concept in one form or another of father. Okay? And then father becomes much more complicated, just like the one about mother. And eventually we have, we're talking about fathers as priests, fathers of the mysteries, so on and so forth. Mm. So that from that basic core idea, it becomes infinitely more complex and sophisticated, and yet the kernel of that basic idea remains. Hmm? So how does that how does that affect our current life, especially if we, we look back at this as a map? And I want to tie a couple of ideas together to kind of frame this question a little bit better. So we look at this kind of evolution that happens as we move out of, of Kemetic Egypt and we start influencing other cultures and ideas start to spring up. And we get this notion of Kundalini, this exploration of the life force, which shows us this early part of the collective memory and this insight to our birthing mm -hmm. process as a species. Now, as we progress, more and layers of this gets repressed, essentially, for good reason, because again, as you so rightly mentioned, some of them don't really function in that social norm at the time. We could be overwhelmed with it. But at the same time, we understand that we are influenced very deeply in our day-to-day -day lives by the unconscious. It you know, yes. makes the decision of the groups we associate to the relationship yes. we end up having. It's it's pretty much the controlling factor for most people. Um, I think for most of us, unconsciously of our life, it's that that key tool. Kabbalistically speaking, the idea of looking at the tree of life as a set of correspondence. And then in psychology, we also have the idea of free association, right? The yes. looking at that as a, a little bit of a roadmap into exploring these archetypes and how they get set up. What is the what is the job there of the seeker? What is the path that we should do there? What are some tools besides free so is free association a primary tool? How should we look at understanding the archetypal mind within ourselves, the and and using that as a doorway to the unconscious? And how do we relate to it in our society and other people as well? Um and kind of capture that projection, which is difficult to do. But what's your thoughts? Well, my, my, my own sense about this is that uh, we are always going to be in a state of not knowing in many areas. You no, know, the, the medieval notion of the cloud of unknowing, mm. we're always going to be to some extent uh, surrounded by that. And uh, that is part of the mystery of who and what we are. But in that cloud of unknowing, uh, there are certain things that do become clear. And one of them is what is outside of us, what we are attracted to, where we are sense ourselves going. And the other, however, is just as deep, is that inside of ourselves that draws toward other things. Hmm. Let, me, let me be very concrete. There are many different um, spiritual paths. 
for me, most of them are quite legitimate. Why go down one as opposed to another? If you live in a relatively large society, like in, say, in South Africa, here in the United States, Europe, other places where one can choose what religious or political affiliation, spiritual affiliation you want, how do you choose? Well, you have to know who and what you are, what your proclivities are, what your sweet spots are, what you are afraid of. All of those go into what you will then see outside of yourself. Mm. And the two are connected. The two are connected because someone else can have the same choices as you, be born right around the street from you in the same hospital on the same day. But their intuition about the world process is going to be different than yours. And they have to know themselves and you have to know yourself because further down the road, what is the deepest part of you has to intuitively know itself so that it can decide I'm really pulled toward the path of panpsychism mm. and its expression in uh, Kundalini. Or I realize that I am a quiet, reflective soul or spirit. And so the contemplative sciences are going to be what attracts me. It's not the matter of one being better than the other. It's a matter of where you, where you live in the world, in, the, in yourself. And knowing it and trusting it well enough, that doesn't mean always approving of it. <laughs> mm. Part of knowing yourself is knowing what you don't like about yourself. Mm. Mm. Self-honesty. <laughs> yeah, Self-honesty. Some, some, some humility. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But that allows you to also know where not to go. Mm. Mm. Also knows where not to go. The, the kind of because honest, that is a dangerous way. place for you to go. That's mm. a dangerous place for you to go. Mm. You're going to be. If you go down that that particular path, whatever it is, you know you're going to be distracted, mm. uh, tempted by all kinds of things, and you're going to waste a whole lot of energy going round and round in circles. It's entertaining, but it's not going to get you very far. Whereas mm. wholesome self discipline and honesty will allow you to choose a path that is going to help you progress. And that is what, uh, you know, part of what I believe, this is just me speaking, but that is what I believe is part of what happens for us when we come back to this earth, come back to a different body, when we reincarnate, when we're learning about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we're, if you look at the issue of reincarnation from a certain perspective, it indicates that we're moving towards something and we're using these bodies to test stuff out as we progress and unfold towards something, something mm. that's infinitely beyond our present capacity to conceptualize. We're luminous beings. So that's, that's something that kind of like brings me to pretty much this, we don't have a lot of time left. So that I want to kind of squeeze in as much as I can while I've got some time with you. Um, there's the, the ideas of modern day personas. Um, for example, Jung's idea of the, the 12 kind of major personas. And then there's discussions around the concept of how those relate to the 12 signs of the Zodiac, the, and how that connects to the 12 apostles and this kind of yes. templative process, which is so nicely described in this progressive evolution of this idea now we look at for example um practices like voodoo santeria the entire journey of it that kind of roots itself back into and connects very much to the african yoruba um tradition uh, specifically the ifa that you also kind of emphasize or discuss inside of the work now we're very familiar about some of the roots of where some of these have been taken, uh, how during the slave trades, um, people were kind of kidnapped really and, and sold and, you know, in case moved into other areas and there's influences, but those patterns that are discovered as we kind of explore that. And we go down into from the 16 tribes, we go to the 256 patterns of the, um, the Dafa that can be seen inside of that. So there are these almost geometrical, these sacred, out of this collective unconsciousness that seems to speak 
of a higher perception or a higher degree of yes. What's your view there? What, what can you tell us about that? Well, I, 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 I follow along exactly with what you said. There, there are indications that there are, there are levels of our consciousness which we do not explore generally on a day-to-day -day basis. We're pretty comfortable right now, our, uh, our society, with the notion that there is an, quote, unconscious mind, unquote, mm -hmm. below our conscious mind or ego. It's not always pretty. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's pretty ugly in there. Sometimes it's wonderful in there. But we all kind of accept that we have an unconscious mind. We've, we've, we've progressed that far. Where we have not gone very much until relatively recent times is the notion that above our conscious mind, beyond our ego, there mm. are levels of consciousness that we are still unfolding and aspiring and moving toward. Mm. And that, as we mentioned earlier, is the super conscious. Mm -hmm. We experience that briefly when we, during moments of, 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 of inspiration or moments when we have a radical new thought in science or the arts or philosophy or whatever. And we often say, wow, that's, that's it. Wow, that's amazing. And you do not get to that point by logical deduction. Mm -hmm. You did it by induction and intuitive leaps. Mm -hmm. And it's not a straight line. And it's almost as if it comes in bursts and levels and waves. That is the superconscious. And everybody knows uh, what it means briefly. It's a state of, 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 of awareness and insight, but not necessarily insight uh, based upon language. Let me give you an example. And folks can uh, only hear this. Imagine yourself, someone is, 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 is leading you down a road in which they're telling you a joke. Okay and they lead you to the end of it, and then they tell the joke. And the joke, when you get it, it takes you off in a different direction. You didn't mm. expect that. And for a split second, you go, oh, <laughs> right. For a split second, you weren't really verbally thinking. You were having an insight mm. into something. Okay. Now imagine having being in a, a discipline, contemplative or... Um, a, a static dance or whatever your pathway is, and you get to the stage where you're having insight after insight after insight after insight, 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 insight. Wow. Well, right? That's out of the box completely. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a state of illumination. Yeah, your mind is in a totally different place. It doesn't have any boundaries. Oof. It's not, it's not verbal. Hmm. It's understanding, but it's not a verbal understanding. It's not mm. a linguistic understanding. Mm. It's an intuitive apprehension of the world process, moment to moment. That's a, that's that's a fantastic metaphor. That's such a great metaphor. It kind of reminds me about uh, one of the descriptions of the use of psilocybin mushrooms in individuals, how it can tend to overlap different neural networks. And that yes. sudden overcoming of information um, creates these what can be described as hallucinations, these hallucinatory experiences of visualization, because it's just so outside of the data of the known frames, the known containers of what we're familiar yes. with. Yes. So yes. in that sense, like as we come to the close, it, it, this is a question that I want to ask, and it's, it's part of a personal point of view, um, but I, I want to get your insight on it, given the kind of the journey that we've taken together throughout this conversation. We, we are in a time right now where um, there's so many isms uh, of divide uh, inside, of our, inside of our cultures, whether it's um, racial separations, you know, whether it's cultural separations. I mean, we've seen that in South Africa very clearly where people that literally share the same skin color still create separations of themselves because of tribe um, or because mm -hmm. of group that they are in, families, so to speak, between families. Um, can this be, uh, we see it obviously on larger scales in the world at the moment as well, but can this be very much a manifestation of our inability to merge or become one with these portions 
of our own unconscious is very much what happens in the world right now. Could that be us being unable to fundamentally accept and integrate in a healthy way these aspects of our collective psyche? And if so, how do we begin that journey of healing as a people? Well, I take a slightly different perspective on that, is that, yes, I agree with you. It, it represents at each juncture, at each level, an inability at that time to integrate that. Okay. And yet we do, in many cases over the centuries, do manifest, do uh, exp express the capacity to integrate it. I mean, in South Africa, you were at a point where you either changed or your society fell apart. Mm. And you made a decision to do that. We are here in the United States with the same thing, okay? Uh, but you're also right that uh, uh, people with the same skin color, sometimes the same religion, can find ways to make uh, it the other separate, the other. Mm. And I would suggest to you that on some level, as beings, as a species, we need that kind of internal structure, that like internal struggle. That seems to be intrinsic to how we grow. Interesting. It's, you know, it's not very pretty. Yes. But it seems to be the way that we kind of push the boundaries and push the levels. Mm. It seems to be kind of a tension state that once we break through it, there's a temporary, ah, and then the tension state builds up again around something else. We seem to grow that way. The, that, and now, I just want to add this one last yeah. thing. As a species, we're going to have to overcome huge barriers around this because, as you point out, we're at a unique stage in our history. We are about to step off the planet for the first time. The Purely military exploration of space is now giving way to the commercial exploration of space. Mm. And it doesn't take much reading to realize that we're probably not alone. And so what are we going to encounter when we're out there? And we better have our act together. Mm. It's, we see it in every act. Our species at war with itself. Mm. We are. And it's a pretty taxing war. That's that's a fact. That's a very, very well put fact. And such a great piece to kind of close off in the notion of it's the tension is meant to be there. The struggle, if yes. I'm understanding that correctly, the tension supposed to be there. The problem is when we get stuck in the tension, instead of right. evolving and shape shifting, so to speak, with it, it kind of reminds me of one of the old translations of the name of God in the biblical sense when Moses asks the name of the burning bush and it says, a year, a year, a year, which translates as I will be that which I will be, that constant evolving nature. And we're now at a, yes. at a super juncture point to either evolve right. or die. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so in a way, our, our tensions, our struggles, our dramas is actually revealing to us the areas yes. that we have to work on or have to now bring into the conscious portion. They've been there in the collective unconscious, and we need to now bring them in the conscious portion to heal and to improve from, to Yes. Turn the darkness into light to turn that transformation into things. Doctor, that was Bruce. That was that's amazing. That is a, such a great frame. As we come to a close, and I, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time with you here. But what would be your last kind of closing message to everyone listening to this, to the people in South Africa, to everybody out there in the audience? If you could leave one last impression of what you believe is an important message at this time for everybody. Um. If I had to be able to say it in as, uh, as poor a way as I can uh, articulate it, um, the best way I can articulate it is that we are, for better or for worse, one species. Neurologically, anthropologically, biologically, 
and spiritually. We are, and we have differences amongst ourselves. We always will. We will be uh, exploring these issues uh, when we're exploring other parts of other solar systems in the eons to come. Mm. And we will have the same struggles. We can be orbiting, inhabiting planets in the Alpha Centauri region, our progeny. But they will have many of the same struggles that we're talking about because it's embedded in our nervous system as a species. That is who and part of who we and what we are. That we will always be a species that seeks transcendence. We seek transcendence because the energy and the dynamics, spiritually and otherwise, of transcendence it's always of us continuing to unfold and go beyond what we are. We are luminous beings. And by definition, there are no boundaries to that. One day we'll look back on this as a childhood of our species. That's like you and I can look back on ourselves as five-year-olds and remember what it was like, the way we thought the world was, and now realize how infinitely more complex it is. Mm. We will do that as a species someday. And hopefully we look back upon ourselves with some compassion and humor. <laughs> the template we the template we write today is literally the inheritance of the collective unconscious. We deliver our yes. children for tomorrow and for their work for the rest of our species across the universe. Yes. Power. Yes. Powerful message there. Bruce, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor. I really loved our time. I'm sad that it's at an end. Um, and I do hope I get an opportunity to speak to you again in the future, but just for myself. Absolutely would have brought me the opportunity to do it. I really enjoyed this. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. I've always felt a little different, a little uneasy between regular folk, a bit of a dreamer, a lost cause, a little non-ordinary, some would say. I think I've always just been this way. My mother said I was special. My father thought I should be feared. But I knew that witchcraft coursed through my veins the first time I tasted the lips of the goddess inside the rain. Yes, I'm a witch, it's true. And sure, we are the ones who believe in the beauty of nature, who believe in the things science, absent of art, cannot explain. Who instead of religion would have romance. And sure, you may think we have lost our way. When in the world of predictable things, we have such unfamiliar things that we would like to say. But maybe in a world so cold and alone, a little unfamiliar is exactly what is needed to show us the way.